So what, what constitutes a, a minimally invasive ablative treatment of prostate cancer is the utilization uh, of physical energy to destroy prostate cancer. The ablative energy, it may be delivered to the prostate by focusing the external energy into the prostate or inserting uh, an energy delivery system directly into the lesion. It's an outpatient procedure performed with or without general anesthesia uh, and fewer complications than standard whole gland therapy. So what would constitute a focal ablation? It can be the, just destroying the lesion, the lesion with a margin, a quadrant, hemiablation, hockey stick, uh, all uh, would be considered focal ablation. I think the uh, potential advantages are self-evident. It's targeted, you can repeat it. Uh, outpatient procedure, lower cost, less injury to periprostatic uh, structures, and it may even induce uh, an anti-tumor immune response. I don't have time uh, to, uh, to really uh, uh, justify all of these uh, uh, six bullets that I think uh, what you must believe uh, in order to uh, embrace focal ablation. Uh, that Gleason 6 is not a lethal cancer and doesn't require immediate intervention. That cancers with a small component of pattern 4 do not require immediate intervention. The aggressiveness of uh, multifocal cancers is typically defined by an index or dominant lesion that the uh, MRI identifies uh, the site of clinically significant disease, that targeted biopsy improves risk stratification of disease, and that we have the ability to reliably destroy or ablate uh, clinically significant cancers. Uh, so uh, at given additional time, I would actually provide uh, a validation uh, uh, of, those, uh, of, of those points. Uh, the energy sources that are available in the U.S., we have HIFU, cryo, interstitial laser, uh, irreversible electroporation, which is a nano knife and brachytherapy, and under development uh, is RF and uh, vascular photodynamic uh, therapy. So I think like with every uh, indication for intervention, uh, there are excellent, good, marginal, and just poor candidates for focal ablation. Uh, I think the factors that uh, you must uh, consider are life expectancy, the site uh, and extent uh, and aggressiveness of the disease, and what are the patient's outcome priorities. It must be a shared decision, and again, like any intervention, uh, you really need to provide valid outcome expectations. So the, uh, in selecting candidates for focal ablation, uh, we rely on a pretreatment and a high-quality uh, multiparametric uh, MRI unilateral uh, MRI lesion, a Gleason less than eight disease concordant with the MRI lesion because at times the patient has a, uh, a systematic biopsy uh, and then they have their MRI afterwards, and no gross extra caps or extension, and no apical MRI lesion extending to the extreme distal prostate. So I think the real concern is uh, oncologic control following focal ablation. So in order to uh, address, uh, I think, the, uh, the fundamental concern of focal uh, ablation, we ended up uh, uh, extracting cases that met the criteria that I just uh, established for focal ablation uh, from the 832 men who had undergone radical prostatectomy at our institution. So they fulfilled the criteria, yet they had undergone a, a radical prostatectomy. Uh, and at our center, all of the radical prostatectomy specimens, uh, their whole mounts, uh, and all of the uh, lesions uh, in the prostate are actually um, uh, mapped uh, by the, uh, by the uh, pathologist. Uh, and, and what we then looked at, and again, the, we, we said, okay, here is the MRI lesion that we see. And, and let's assume, and that is a, a bit of a leap of faith, that we can a, a, ablate that index lesion. What's the likelihood that we would identify pattern four outside of that uh, ablation zone? Uh, and this would be assuming we did a, a lesion plus 10 millimeters, which is the uh, conclusion from uh, Samir at our institution, in order to uh, reliably control, uh, control disease. So the MRI identified the index lesion in 93% of cases, and no surprise, uh, that it, even in candidates for focal ablation, uh, that 25% uh, of the patients uh, had, uh, only 25% had unifocal uh, disease. But what this shows uh, is that when we look to see what percentage of patients had any pattern four outside of what would have been the ablation zone with a margin of 10 millimeters, uh, whether we did the, uh, the uh, ablation plus 10 millimeters 
or a hemiablation, there was 20% of patients would have pattern four uh, outside, of the, uh, outside of our ablation zone. Now the median size of the actual lesion uh, was five millimeters, and that's why we often missed it uh, on the MRI, but more importantly that the amount of pattern four uh, was less than one millimeter. So in candidates for focal ablation, the majority have multifocal disease. We get it. That uh, the multiparametric MRI plus uh, a sextant uh, biopsy is very effective for identifying the index lesion. Again, 20% of men will have pattern four uh, outside of the uh, ablation zone. But again, for many of my colleagues who will just simply dismiss focal ablation on the basis of, uh, of, uh, of, of leaving pattern four, the trap that I set for them is I say, well, do you believe in active surveillance for low risk disease? And of course, everybody does. Well, what's the percentage of patients who have untreated pattern four? It's 50%. So in, if we in fact ablate the lesion, then the disease that we will follow with active surveillance is far less than the patient that everybody feels is safe to follow uh, for, uh, for Gleason, uh, Gleason 6. So in selecting appropriate candidates for focal ablation, uh, again, this patient would not have fit into the, uh, uh, our, our criteria, but this is a 78-year-old healthy sexually active man uh, with a 15 millimeter Pyrats 4. Uh, we did an MR uh, targeted and systematic biopsy. He actually had a Gleason 9, it was a, a centimeter, and it was limited uh, to, the, uh, to the target. He refused the radical prostatectomy and radiation therapy, and so do I think that by ablating this disease in a 79-year-old man uh, may in fact uh, provide uh, an oncologic benefit that would suffice? I do. Uh, a 58-year-old healthy sexually active man with a six millimeter Pyrats 3, he undergoes a fusion target biopsy, systematic biopsy. Two of the four cores are positive for Gleason 6, one would be 70%. You know, I think that when we talk about aggressive disease, it has to be within the context of the host. So if I have a 58-year-old man, uh, he has a six millimeter lesion, uh, that I believe uh, does pose uh, a threat over that patient's lifetime. Uh, and if we can ablate this lesion with minimal uh, side effects, I think this is a very appropriate candidate, despite the fact that I would be treating you know, low risk disease. A 72 year old healthy sexually active man with a 10 millimeter uh, Pyrats 4 lesion encroaching the capsule. Uh, his fusion target biopsies are positive for Gleason 3 plus 4 uh, with all systematic biopsies. Now, I think this is the ideal candidate for focal therapy. Preserving sexual function is important despite uh, all of your skill, whether it's robotic or open radical prostatectomy. This patient is likely to have erectile dysfunction. Uh, and uh, I believe that this is a lesion with his life expectancy. We can control his uh, disease uh, and achieve his, uh, his priorities. Um, here's the very first candidate that, that I treated with, uh, with focal ablation. This was the time that we we're doing inbore uh, uh, focal laser ablation, 78 year old. In fact, uh, the father of one of my colleagues. Uh, he had a, a PSA of 5 in 1998, and he had a systematic biopsy. There was no cancer. He then had a green light, and he came in with a 100 gram gland, a PSA of 14. Uh, so one of my colleagues uh, did a random biopsy, uh, and it showed one core of, uh, of Gleason 6 and a 100 gram gland. Uh, he then had a, a, an MRI. That was before we did MRIs prior to all biopsies at our institution. Uh, and, and, and you can see uh, uh, the, uh, the lesion on the, uh, uh, on the diffusion scan, the low signal intensity, uh, and then uh, on the high B that, that uh, 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 lights up. So that is right concordant where his, uh, uh, where his random biopsy in a 100 gram gland had a one millimeter focus. Uh, so, uh, and being a Pyrats 4, uh, as Peter showed, we had real concern that maybe this, in fact, was a, a, a higher risk uh, a disease. Uh, the family wanted a radical. He didn't want anything. So we all compromised and we did his uh, ablation. Uh, and we'll just fast forward. Uh, this is now uh, in uh, four years later. Uh, all of his biopsies uh, have been uh, negative, uh, and he has now developed a Pyrats uh, 2. Uh, in his left uh, peripheral lateral apex, which is seen here. Again, the arrow shows uh, the low signal intensity on the T2 without any uh, diffusion uh, uh, issues. Uh, so we feel that uh, this guy's disease has been, has been effectively managed. Uh, he had no uh, consequences, uh, and uh, I think we did the right thing in him. 
Uh, perioperative treatment related complications of ablation, there's LUTs, there's duration of the urinary catheter, post procedural uh, retention, uh, sexual function. Again, on these guys, uh, the, the real motivation for some potential oncologic compromise is the uh, preservation of sexual function. You better tell them you may have a little bit of ejaculatory uh, uh, the diminishment. Uh, because they'll come in and they're confident, uh, they're, everything's perfect. They say, but doc, I mean, look, what did you do to me? My ejaculate volume is diminished. So, you know, these guys have certain priorities uh, that are driving their decision making. So it's best to disclose that that might be one of their uh, uh, only consequences of, uh, of treatment. And the more that you ablate, uh, the more that these issues uh, will, uh, uh, will uh, be problematic during their uh, postoperative recovery. We typically take out the catheter one to seven days, depending upon the extent of ablation and their preoperative uh, LUTs. Uh, we assess complications at two weeks. So, so what we do at six months, uh, we do an MRI and we do a reflex biopsy. Everyone gets a biopsy of the targeted zone. Uh, we then follow them uh, with, uh, with PSA. We do an MRI in a year. Uh, and then we do another reflex biopsy at two years. And I'll show you that data, which we'll present at the AUA. My big concern is that you do bad focal ablation, the patient loves you. They're continent, they're potent, but you didn't do anything for their disease. Uh, you do a bad radical, the PSA doesn't become undetectable and they're incontinent. You do bad focal therapy, the guy loves you because he has no consequences. And I think that's the real problem and the concern I have about quality control because while this seems, oh, it's a little lesion, uh, we're throwing in a little energy, I think the real downside uh, is failure to do it right. So how do we optimize outcomes? It's training, it's patient selection, uh, it's appropriate use of technology, it's meticulous technique, and it's rigorous oncological uh, assessment. So what do we know in 2017? We can do this. It's outpatient. It truly is minimal treated related complications. It's a very expedited recovery. We have probably done uh, 200 cases collectively at our institution. I've had no patient even require a, a pad. Uh, and there is some minimal erectile dysfunction the more that we extend the ablation zone. We're looking at this critically in many cases that, that, is, uh, that is transient. So what don't we know? The optimal energy source, the extent of the ablation zone. Uh, what really should be our post-operative uh, assessment of, uh, of oncologic control? And we have absolutely no credible, and I emphasize credible, intermediate or long-term outcomes. So in selecting the energy source, it's going to depend upon the size of the prostate, prostatic calcifications, location of the cancer. Again, I think for those uh, who are thinking of uh, embarking on focal therapy, what's the startup cost? What's really the precision of energy delivery and the confluence of our energy delivery uh, and out-of-pocket costs uh, to the patient? I think the extent of ablation is going to depend upon the site of the disease. Uh, if this is an anterior lesion, you can ablate to your heart's desire. There's going to be very little uh, consequences of extending that ablation zone outside of the prostate. You know, if this is uh, posterolateral, then again, the, lo the more you extend the ablation zone, the greater the potential consequences on potency, uh, apex versus base, uh, and again, its localization to the near the proximity of the nerve vascular bundle, uh, the dependent on the risk of the uh, of the disease, and really what we're doing here, it's a balance between the treatment related risks and, and oncologic control. And to some degree, uh, it is the more that we ablate, the issue is, is that going to make a salvage radical prostatectomy uh, of greater uh, technical limitations? Uh, but, uh, and, and, and I, I think that, the, again, the greater the ablation zone, the greater the potential limitations. So is tissue diagnosis mandatory? And if you go through whatever literature there is, uh, there's sort of a trend to suggest that, you know, if you do uh, a, a, an MRI uh, and that MRI is, uh, is negative, uh, then that really doesn't mandate uh, 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 biopsy. So this is, we'll present this at the AUA. Uh, it's 32 men who underwent focal laser ablation. And, and really, at, so 96% at, at of these guys at six months had a negative uh, ablation zone biopsy, and as we said, we'll target four into the, uh, into the lesion. And in fact, we'll do the, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in the discussion, we actually do the systematic biopsy on the side of the ablation because we do have some issues with, uh, with, with, with co-registration. Uh, and, and again, we had 100% compliance in getting a two-year MRI. 
uh, but we did not have 100% compliance in our mandated uh, biopsy. We did the best that we could. But what we showed is that if you have an MRI lesion, and this is really using contrast enhancement because the diffusion is of limited value in identifying uh, uh, refractory uh, disease in the ablation zone, that all of the patients had cancer uh, and 75% of those were pattern four or higher. So you gotta do an MRI uh, in your, uh, in your, in your follow-up. Uh, and if that is positive, you got to do a targeted biopsy, and most likely uh, there will be pattern four. How about the guys who had a negative biopsy, so of a, a negative MRI? So of the 16 that allowed us to do a biopsy, uh, nine of them showed cancer, uh, and of those, four of them had Gleason pattern six. And remember, we're doing six, four cores into this lesion, uh, and in many of those patients, it was actually low volume pattern four. Uh, and so the majority of those patients with a negative MRI who had a, a negative biopsy at six months, they had cancer. But I think the decision when you have an MRI that's negative at two years, what you should ask yourself, what is actionable? So this is a guy, he's 75 years of age and Gleason pattern six is not gonna influence subsequent intervention, then probably a negative MRI is adequate without uh, a biopsy. But if having pattern six is gonna influence your management, then you should go ahead and do a biopsy. And again, this is a small subset, but those guys with a negative MRI who had a positive biopsy, they had a higher PSA velocity of, 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 of greater than uh, 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 four months. So, so what I would say uh, is that uh, with a negative MRI uh, and, a and a slow PSA velocity, then maybe the MRI uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is adequate, um, and again, using the PSA velocity greater than, than four. So again, what do we call oncologic control? This is the debate. So I would say that you have to do a biopsy, you have to report if in fact there's any cancer, uh, but just because you have cancer doesn't mean it's failure of the, uh, of the, uh, of the treatment. And again, uh, many of the patients who have recurred have actually gone on uh, to, uh, to, re, to re-treatment. So I'm confident the lesion can be successfully ablated, uh, but maybe less confident now that we actually looked at our two-year data. Uh, I'm confident that we're leaving small volume of Gleason pattern four in the untreated zone. And if you believe in active surveillance, you gotta believe in active surveillance uh, in this cohort. Uh, that clinically significant recurrences or new tumors uh, may develop over their life expectancy. I don't think we burn bridges for future curative treatment. And we really do have a major benefit uh, in terms of uh, uh, quality of life outcomes. So uh, the title was, Is It Ready for Prime Time? I think there's an unmet need for treatment between surveillance and a whole gland treatment. The rationale is compelling. The patient selection really needs better uh, definition. And the assessment of short and long-term oncologic control, I believe today, until we have a, a, a additional data, is it's driven by uh, their PSA, their biopsy, uh, and, uh, and MRI. I think the preliminary early results, I would say encouraging, the intermediate long-term outcomes are lacking, and urologists, we have to play a responsible, and I underscore responsible and leading role in assessing the indications and treatments. If we don't do it, the interventional radiologists will, and we must inform patients of both potential benefits and harms uh, until we have uh, long-term outcomes are defined. Uh, industry must commit to training. I think if done responsibly, focal target ablation can has the potential to advance uh, our treatment of prostate cancer. If done irresponsibly, then patients will be harmed. So focal ablation must be one of the many tools available to the urologist, so hopefully, uh, you know, uh, you, you, you'll at least gain some, uh, some interest. Uh, I, I think it's imperative uh, and uh, it, to the urologist in order to optimally treat the spectrum of prostate cancer and the varying priorities of men uh, with the disease. Is it ready for prime time? No. Uh, the focal targeted therapy, I think, is ready for critical uh, investigation. Thank you.